Francis by Charles Shaw, and it's going to be um, a somewhat political piece. So this is, you know, this community, what would it be without politics? It's important, and it, politics were really important to Robert. He was very interested, he was very current on world affairs and anything that was happening in the world. The first thing in the morning he would do is, as a good New Yorker, he would open the New York Times on the internet and read probably for an hour, hour and a half. But um, here's Charles, and I hear that um, Robert was the only person who ever dared to call him Charlie. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Martina, for this honor, really. It means a lot to me. And thank you, MAPS, for giving me the opportunity to pay tribute to a man that was very special to us. Um, okay, so let's get down with the business first and foremost. I am not a painter, okay? I am not a painter. I do not know how to draw. If you looked at my stick figures, they would look like they all had scoliosis, okay? So, I'm not even going to try to like attempt a commentary about Robert Benoist's work and what it means in the larger canon of visionary art. But I do know politics, and so did Robert. And so in my tribute tonight, I'd like to show you another side of this man. Uh, so I'm gonna take you on a little journey, and I hope that you all bear with me uh, until we get through to the other side. So, I've recently been reading a book by Tom Hayden. It's called Voices of the Chicago Eight, A Generation on Trial. I suppose I don't have to explain why a book like this appeals to somebody like me, or why I feel like the stories that this book tells are once again germane to the state that our nation once again finds itself in. As you all know, Tom Hayden had a front seat for the spectacle that was our country's last period of massive social unrest. This exploded during the spring of 1968 and would not calm for many years to come. Now, Hayden describes the beginning of 1968 as, quote, feeling like he was living on the knife edge of history. He goes on to describe what today might sound like a rather familiar scenario. It did, of course, turn out to be a year of extraordinary turmoil a climax to events that had begun five years earlier with the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. But in 1968, a massive and continuous malfunction occurred. The power elite, which had been portrayed as invincible, was under siege on all sides. The breakdown not only happened in Chicago, not only in America, in some mysterious ways it was a global phenomenon. Like a Greek drama, it started with legendary events, then raised hopes, only to end by immersing innocence in tragedy. An experience, for those who went through it, felt to this day in failed dreams, enduring hurts, and unmet yearnings. When I met Tom Hayden in 2004, it was a scant three years after 9-11 which was my generation's catastrophic and catalyzing event. This event altered the course of the nation permanently. And why were we there? We were in the streets of New York to protest during the Republican National Convention. And like Chicago in 1968, this is the first political convention that had been held after both a national tragedy and the start of an illegal and largely unpopular war. We all had such high expectations for the protests, so I asked Tom if he felt that 2004 had equal significance to 1968. No! He spat rather loudly. And I'm sick of hearing that. This is nothing like 1968. The country was torn in half over Vietnam. No one cares about what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's no youth movement. There's no real movement at all. There's no anti-war candidate, there's no counterculture, and there is definitely no social unrest. Cities were burning in 1968. He was right. He was right. The protest movement put a million people into the streets of New York City, and we were simply ignored. It was ten times the amount of what was in Chicago in 1968. There was no refutation, there was no counter-argument, there was no renewed debate. 
We were just met with absolute silence. And as a result, nothing changed. Nothing. So the anti-war movement fell apart shortly after Bush was re-elected. And the burnout and futility I felt as an activist pushed me quickly from radical to radically disillusioned. I felt at the time, like Hayden had a generation before, that our movement ended in failed dreams, enduring hurts, and unmet yearnings. I left activism. A year and a half later, I met Bob Venosa at an Entheon Village fundraiser in Chicago that had been raided and shut down by the police. I was new to this world of this community of psychonauts and visionary artists, these so-called burners. Most of the night I wandered around the party, sporting short hair and a political t-shirt and feeling really, really out of place. And when the police stormed in, they surrounded the perimeter of the room and they just stood there, waiting for the order to move in and clear the space. Bobby was the only person to say anything. He got up on stage and started railing about the Chicago police. He talked about their brutality at the 1968 convention, which he had witnessed firsthand. And he was ashamed to see that they still seemed to have it out for the counterculture all these years later. He called them out without a shred of concern for his own safety or well-being. He was the lone voice of dissent in a room in which perhaps only he was old enough to remember the violence that took place in these same streets all those years ago. I wanted to run up on stage and join him in some kind of like show of solidarity, but I couldn't. I was on parole. I had just gotten out of prison after serving a year for possessing 11 pills of MDMA. 11. I wasn't even supposed to be there. Trust me, a psychedelic warehouse party is definitely in violation of your parole. And I felt helpless. But surely, I thought, Bobby's speech is going to mobilize other people in this room to say something, to speak up and challenge the police. Instead, I looked around, and I saw that virtually the entire room was ignoring me. Right in front of the stage, a group of hippie kids started spinning fire right in front of the police, right in front of Bobby as he was talking. He, Bobby continued to exhort the crowd to some kind of action, take a stand on the ring. But kids could be seen walking past and rolling their eyes. They didn't care really what he was saying. They didn't see the police as an instrument of political or cultural oppression. What they saw was essentially their parents shutting down their party and taking away their raver toys. They sulked away, pouting and whining, and they never uttered a word in protest. To my utter dismay, it reconfirmed everything that I had seen and felt at that time about the apathy and narcissism of my generation, the Gen Xers, and the upcoming millennial generation. With only a few minutes before the police were going to close in, I slipped out of the venue and went home, propelled by a mixture of anger and sadness and shame. Now, over the next few years, I really had the pleasure of getting to know Bobby and Martina better, mostly through our connection with the Entheon Village community. Bobby was exceedingly gracious and generous supporter of my work. He gave me a lot of praise for my book, Exile Nation, and I held a real special place for his praise. It was from one radical to another. It was from one brother of struggle to another. And it came from somebody who understood social justice, who understood freedom of expression, freedom of consciousness, and that supreme battle of will that is one's relationship to one's own creativity. Undeniably, he was a transcendent artist whose visions were translated into unimaginable works of depth and detail, but he was also a damn fine man. He had a great sense of humor. He was intrinsically irreverent and shyly sweet in the way that only the deeply feeling are. I last saw him in October of 2010 when I visited him and Martina at their place in Boulder. He had been struggling with his health for a while, and you could tell he was tired, but he was sharp as a blade, and he was in great spirits. We talked movement politics and exchanged stories about the Chicago police, 
He bitched a bit about Obama, and then he told me some stories about Dali and Albert Hoffman. This man was a respected elder in our communities, and I was able to understand that there was something in our interaction that was an intentional passing of the torch from one generation to another. Bobby encouraged me to keep speaking truth and to never abandon the struggle. Art can still change the world, Charlie. But if we lose the freedom to express ourselves, we would have only ourselves to blame. At the time of his death in August, I lamented that he passed away while America was still in a death trance of apathy and self-absorption. Yes, there was still a tiny cadre of us radicals and visionaries who kept alive, if not the rhetoric, then at least the spirit of revolution. But where were these disenfranchised masses? Would they ever care about anything? None of us could have seen what was right around the corner. It was as if Bobby's passing opened this rift in the universe, and a beam of pure transformative energy slammed into the earth, ground zero, Zuccotti Park. The movement that Bobby and I had prayed for, this generation's 1968, exploded in September of this year under the name Occupy Wall Street. Ironically, neither of us were around to witness the auspicious birth of this movement. I was out of the country, and Bobby, I'm sure, was kicking it on a cloud with Dolly and Albert Hoffman, watching the whole thing go down. <laughs> and Terrence McKenna as well. I, I see him with one eye smiling and one eye full of tears, knowing precisely just what Pandora had released from her box, but ready to throw down in the spirit realm for the forces of light. So in honor of the radical spirit and creativity that has driven the Occupy movement, I offer these words of Roberts, which appear in the introduction to his anthology, and which he clearly left for succeeding generations to ponder. Singer.
artist means belonging to a unique, exciting gang of outlaws. It will always be the explorers, artists, poets, curious intellectuals, musicians, and all the other existential samurai who are creatively courageous, who desire to advance their yearnings for higher truth, and who will take the leap of faith into the unknown. The art and architecture of every great or minor culture was given its visual power through the artist. And in fact, culture itself has always been defined through the artist's creativity. The artist has always been the catalyst for change. However, and in contrast, as long as the visionaries provide the slightest glow of enlightenment, the forces of darkness will be there to attempt to prevent and subdue this affront to their power. Visionary art is subversive in its message to the world, and if the government truly had eyes to see and a brain to decipher, they would recognize the dangers inherent in an art that sheds light and inspiration, and I and my colleagues would be hauled away in chains. The message, however, is also subversive in the sense that the common mind cannot entirely escape the subliminal force planted in the creation that will affect superconsciously whomever confronts the art. The form, color, imagery, energy, and spirit in the work contain the seeds of an awakening. And so the battle to shed the light goes on through music, art, and all the other universal creative energies until it becomes a blinding force against the powers of darkness and an uplifting, liberating source of inspiration to all truth seekers. This is a powerful space to work from in any and all events, and it sure beats a day job. In this new era of outlaws, where we're reinventing our heroes and reigniting the fires of idealism, even amidst the realities of a collapsing world, I will continue to remember Robert Venosa as someone who made a difference, who never backed down from who he was or what he stood for. He's most definitely still with us, guiding us through this crisis like a psychedelic ferryman conveying spirits from the underworld of this necrotic empire into a new world where creativity is the new currency, and the seeds of awakening have sprouted into thick vines of collective conscious action. We've still got a long way to go, and it looks like it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better, and they may still haul us away in chains, but as far as I'm concerned, it still needs a day job. Godspeed, gentle spirit, and make sure you save some room on a cloud for the rest of us. Thank you.